Hello and welcome back to Exothermic Plays Games. I'm Exothermic and the date today is Wednesday, July 31st, 2024. I've been doing a countdown of my favorite video games of all time through each day of the year, and coming in at number 154 is the first mainline Pokemon game on the list, Pokemon Sun and Moon. Generation 7 of Pokemon was the last one for the 3DS before Sword and Shield took a stab at radically changing the format of the franchise, and Sun and Moon certainly tried to go out with a bang. The game introduced a lot of concepts, some of which we're still seeing regularly, many we've never seen again, at least in the same exact way. The game takes place in a series of islands that make up the Alola region, which draws heavy inspiration from Pacific Island cultures. Each island is protected by a guardian deity called the Tapus. They're neat legendary Pokemon that all work together to protect the entire region. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail regarding the new Pokemon in this video, but if you want probably way too much opinion and analysis on all of the new ones, check out the hour and a half long ranking video I made that's linked in the description. Of course, the core gameplay is largely the same across all of the Pokemon titles, though Sun and Moon do have some of their own unique wrinkles. You're still battling monsters against each other, catching wild ones with Pokeballs, and challenging other trainers for bragging rights, money, and story progression. Each Pokemon has up to two types, which affects the efficacy of their moves and a whole suite of learnable attacks, also with their own types. There's different type matchups that change the combat math, and I'll dig into all of that later this year, but I do assume, at this point, this isn't really news to anyone watching video game content. Pokemon is Pokemon. But there's of course a special gimmick in the generation with Z-moves. Unlike literally every other mainline Pokemon game, the Alolan region doesn't have an actual gym league. There's no badges, and there's technically not even gyms at all. There's no Elite Four at the end, and the whole progression structure you're used to is nowhere to be seen. Instead, each island has a number of trials you must complete, which are generally little puzzles with some light combat components, concluded by a big boss fight. As a person that loves puzzle games, these puzzles suck. I know that the Pokemon games are meant to be accessible by children, but I mean, they're just laughably bad and easy. It goes from being a puzzle to just being almost a waste of time. But then on the flip side, the boss battles at the end of each trial are some of the best combat in the history of Pokemon. You're fighting what's called Totem Pokemon, which is basically a super deluxe wild Pokemon with crazy beefed up stats, and they keep calling in backup. You're often playing 1v2 and have to deal with the help backing up everything the boss is doing, from healing to defensive abilities to some pretty powerful synergy attacks. If you're not prepared for what the totem Pokemon and its help is going to do, they can be a real challenge. After you beat the first totem Pokemon, you do run into this calling for help mechanic in wild Pokemon fights, which can be cool, it makes random encounters feel a little more interesting, but if you're trying to catch the Pokemon, it does make it take a lot longer because you can't catch anything while there's multiple Pokemon in play, which does make for some annoying things. After you beat the totem Pokemon, the captain who ran the challenge grants you their Z Crystal. Each crystal is associated with a specific type, and you can give it to one of your Pokemon to hold as long as they have at least one attack of that type. Once per fight, you can activate one of your crystals to do a big splashy attack based on the type of crystal the Pokemon is holding. These are kind of fun in the way you can customize your loadouts by pushing strengths of certain Pokemon with type matchups, but it's not actually that interesting, and the animations for it take FOREVER. Doing that in every fight could eat up a lot of time and become very annoying, which is one of the main reasons I do actually dislike the mechanic. Once you beat all of the trials on the island, you can challenge that island's Kahuna, which is kind of like doing a gym leader battle, but you don't have a gym. 
Look, I don't fault them for wanting to try something different, and the idea of an organic system rooted in the culture of these islands is cool. I'm glad they tried it, but I'm also glad they went back to having gyms, even if they're still not quite the same as they used to be. I do like the gym structure. Speaking of organic systems rooted in the culture of the islands, Sun and Moon was the games that introduced regional variants. If you've ever thought Executor was kinda dumb, just wait until you see it as a palm tree. It actually makes sense with the climate until you realize it's a dragon. Why? That I'm not actually sure, and as stupid as it is, I absolutely love Alolan Executor. It's hilarious, and we should not be taking Pokemon seriously. They toyed around with the idea of different forms for Pokemon a whole lot this generation, actually. In addition to regional variants, some Pokemon take different forms in combat or with other factors like time of day. One of my favorite instances of this is Wishy Washy, who has a schooling form where it is either like just a fish or it's many fish. There's more to the game than just sightseeing and island trials, however. On the surface, the antagonist team looks to be Team Skull, a group of thugs that try to steal your Pokemon and apparently try to get a dialogue writer and or translator fired. Just read some of that. It's so bad! There's some characters involved with Team Skull that have some complicated motivations, and while Team Skull is kind of annoying as an overall team, those individual characters are pretty interesting and help the story a lot. For example, you have Gladian, Gladian? I don't know, maybe I should watch the show more, who's teaming up with them as a means to an end in helping the research and training for Type Null, his synthetic Pokemon he has. Type Null is really cool, basically it can change type based on items that it holds, and it evolves into Savali, who, pretty sure if I remember right, does the same. He eventually defects from Team Skull after he learns more about the people really pulling the strings, the Aether Foundation. They're taking the Pokemon stolen by Team Skull to summon Ultra Beasts, which are literal aliens that we've pretty much decided are close enough to Pokemon to still call them Pokemon. This is pretty much where the game loses me, story-wise. Traveling with you is Lily, the local professor's assistant and protector of Nebi, a cosmog that's the key to summoning these Ultra Beasts, and eventually the thing that evolves into your chosen cover Pokemon, Lunala or Solgaleo. You can hear me talk a whole lot about all of that in the aforementioned ranking video. Pokemon Sun and Moon took a lot of risks, and while some of them were definitely misses, they make for a really memorable experience that feels extremely unique within the series. But they're not all misses, of course. I love the totem Pokemon fights, which I think are, generally speaking, better boss fights than the raids found in Generations 8 and 9, though there's some advantages and disadvantages to both, and the riding system feels pretty different. In most Pokemon games, at some point you get a bike to walk around faster, and Pokemon learn Surf to move across water, and some other mobility stuff. That's all gone in Sun and Moon, and you instead get riding licenses that allow you to use the native Pokemon of the region to help fulfill various tasks. It's another thing that makes the game feel different from the rest, though it does make the Pokemon feel a little detached, rather than those abilities, like Surf, coming from the members of your party. That's good and bad. Not needing someone with Surf is nice for your party composition, but you're also missing on the feeling of relying on your own Pokemon, which I think does add something to the experience. Another thing they tried with only this game is Battle Royales, a multiplayer battle situation that kind of levels the playing field a bit. Instead of fighting until each Pokemon is knocked out, four Pokemon fight free-for-all and for a fixed number of rounds. Whoever has the most health left at the end wins, so you could even build a really tanky build, but still win, or if you're overly aggressive, it can put a target on your back. It's really different and good for a change of pace, but admittedly, it's not something that needed to become a mainstay, so I'm fine with it being kind of stuck in Sun and Moon. Perhaps Sun and Moon's biggest issue, however, is pacing. I'm not even talking about grinding, that's just part of Pokemon. I mean just getting to do anything. 
I didn't complete what I would consider the main tutorial section of the game until I had been recording for well over an hour. In most games, that tutorial section probably takes like 20 minutes tops. And as you keep layering on new mechanics, you keep getting more tutorials. At some point, it feels like they're just cramming things in for the sake of putting more into the game. You can be 15 hours in and still find a new tutorial. I'm not trying to rag on it too much because, as evidenced by the ranking, it's still a fun game that I really enjoy, but it is the worst mainline Pokemon game for a reason, and that reason isn't a dragon palm tree. Join me tomorrow as I talk about my 153rd favorite game where I do a barrel roll.